All right, class, this is your uh, lecture seven for your strength training class. Um, as you can see, the scenery is a little bit different. Uh, I couldn't make it back into the gym today uh, where I've been filming. So what we're going to do is just, I'm going to go from right here. Uh, we don't need any equipment or anything. Um, so it's going to be easy to do this lecture. Okay, so um, if you haven't already, print out the lecture. The lecture it's number seven, and uh, there's two things on here. Okay, so this is seems pretty short, but these concepts are essential for you to know, especially the first one. Okay, this is one of the most important things that you're going to learn in this class, and that's the said principle. Okay, so as you can see, the said principle is specific adaptations to impose demands. Now, another way that you can look at this. Uh, principle is really the specificity principle. Okay, so just like um, you know, I've kind of talked about like overload, right? So overload is a concept where you need to ensure that the training is getting more and more stressful over time. Otherwise, you're not going to continue to progress because your body won't be able to adapt. Okay, now if you're assume that we have overloaded something, right? So we are making that training a little bit harder, right? We're uh, progressing it a little bit more and more and more. Well, if you're not doing that in the specific thing that actually matters to whatever your goal is, well, then it doesn't matter if you have overload or not. So the, the big key is that specificity is just as important as your overload. Okay, so in order to see progress and to kind of drive adaptation, you have to make sure that you know, the progression and overload that you provide, that is specific to what you need to have happen, okay? Um, so this really comes down to a needs analysis, okay? So what that means is before you work with anybody, including athletes, you know, patients, whatever, you have to have a very good and clear understanding of what are the needs of this person because you really have to work backward, backwards from there in order to dictate what you're actually going to do for that person in a, you know, in a, a yearly cycle, right? Your macro cycle and, you know, a couple, a two month or a month period, a mesocycle, or even in a micro cycle, that week long period, or like the training day itself. Like you have to work backwards from what you are actually trying to accomplish, which comes down to the needs of the athlete, person, client, etc. Okay. So the, definition that they kind of use here is it's the means the type of demand placed on the body dictates the type of adaptation that will occur, right? So what you need to think about, like the, uh, from your perspective as a coach, as a trainer, as a, you know, um, physiologist, whatever it may be, you are a stress manipulator, right? So what you're really doing when we're prescribing exercise or training or et cetera, is you're prescribing a type and amount of stress. The type and the amount of stress that you prescribe to the body, the, that dictates how the body will react. So that's what it's saying is that the specific type of demand, which is the stress that you're placing, that you give to the body, the body is going to respond to that. So, for example, very simple one. Let's say I want to get better at long distance running. Now, I don't want to do that, but let's just for you know, example, say, say that I do. I really want to get better running long distance and I want to run 10 miles. So would it be specific for me to start lifting more weights? Or would it be specific for me to start biking? Would it be specific for me to start walking? So even though like on the last two, I might still be training like the cardiovascular effect, I'm not doing the task that is actually specific to me getting the goal done. So I'm going to adapt my cardiovascular system very well to, you know, in the biking example, I'm going to adapt that aerobic need, right? I'm going to get those aerobic adaptations, but I'm not going to adapt to the stresses that come along with running. Same thing with walking. I might be able to walk 10 miles, but I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to get the uh, adaptation for running that I need because I have not ran. Another good example for like athletes, right? This is a, probably one of the most basic things that um, are kind of forgotten when you look at all the different things that programming involve. If I have a basketball player and I want them to get better at shooting a free throw, how do I do that? Like what's the specific demand that I need to kind of put on them? Well, shooting free throws, right? It's pretty simple. If I need somebody to get better at, at sprinting, well, then I should have them sprint. If I want somebody to jump higher, then I should have them jump. 
right? So those demands that I decide to place on the person, that will dictate how the body adapts, okay? So as we kind of look a little bit deeper into what specificity and the said principle mean, so the more similar the training activity to the actual sport movement, the greater the likelihood that there will be a positive transfer to sport. Now that statement is very obviously, it's directly related to sports and sports performance of what that means, okay? So you have to kind of put yourself in the shoes of somebody aiming to get somebody better at performance, right? So like I just used in that example, if we're looking at a baseball player, which is uh, kind of um, what's kind of the example here. Now, I want to train that person to get better at hitting. How, what is the specific demand that I should place on them for them to be able to get better at hitting? Well, it's getting in a cage and hitting the ball, or it's getting against a live pitcher and hitting the ball, right? It's taking those attempts, like that's the specific demand I'm trying to get better at. Now, if you look a little bit deeper into like, how does somebody hit the ball and when they do hit it, like how do they hit it harder and further? Then you're kind of looking at things that like strength training might be able to do. And that's kind of what it's saying here. So the athletes training for power and high speed movements, like a baseball pitcher, tennis serve, they should attempt to activate or recruit the same motor units required by their sport at the highest velocity possible. So what that's saying is if I want to get some transfer, okay, like I have somebody who's swinging a bat as hard as they can, they want to hit the ball further. At the end of the day, that requires force, okay? And forces are something that you can manipulate in a person, like the force production capability, and on the velocity side, you can manipulate their rate of force development or how fast they can develop that force. So things in the weight room that are gonna help a baseball player hit a ball far farther, and if you look at the type of movement that a baseball swing is or a tennis serve is, it's a very quick and powerful bout right? It's boom, done, or boom, done, okay? Now, obviously, in tennis, you have to keep playing after that, but we're talking about the purposes of the serve, right? It's a boom, quick movement, less than a second, in less than half a second, or even a quarter of a second. It's very quick, but powerful, right? So, the type of training that I do, especially if we look at, like, strength training, that should mimic things that are like that. So, where there is a very high velocity, and there's a lot of force being produced, okay? Now, if um, we look at the next statement, it says incorporating resistance training exercises that mimic the movement patterns of the athlete sport increases the likelihood that muscles involved in the sport will be recruited. Now this statement is something you have to be very careful with, okay? Because at its core, right, let's say that I'm trying to get somebody to hit a baseball uh, further, right, when they're, when they're swinging the bat. So if we kind of look at this, it's like, all right, if I want to get somebody better at that, that task, if we look down here on the examples, for example, if we look at the throwing and pitching, barbell pullover, overhead tricep extension, shoulder internal, external rotation, right? Now, those are the resistance training exercises that might have a transfer over, right? But what's the actual exercise that's going to get somebody better at throwing and pitching? Throwing and pitching. What's the exercise that's gonna get somebody better at running and sprinting? Running and sprinting. Okay, what's the exit? Like you see where I'm going with this. Now, the, the task itself, like the motor task, is what I'm talking about there. That's the specific thing that's going to get you better at that task. Now, what we can do from a strength standpoint, and this is where I was talking about the forces and whatnot, from a strength standpoint, is that you can give somebody the tools to essentially do that maybe better. You, you can give somebody the tools to have a higher speed or have an ability to produce more force. So if we look at it, uh, like the long jump, for example, long jump. The long jump is predicated on someone's ability uh, on how they, produce, how they produce force and how much they produce force at takeoff, okay? So if we look at it from its core, if we have somebody who can jump 20 feet and somebody that can jump 25 feet, at the end of the day, it comes down to the fact that the second person who can jump 25 feet produces more force at a faster velocity than the other person, and that's why they can jump further. So if we look at that problem from a resistance training standpoint, well, one of the ways that we can help the, the other person, that 20-foot person, is we allow them and teach them and give them exercises that will help them develop more force at a faster rate, okay? Now, these exercises that they list here are very, very general. 
Okay, this is a general type of exercise that might relate to a sporting movement. The biggest thing coming out of the specificity in this whole set principle is that when we're looking at these things, you need to understand that the motor task that you're talking about will improve by you doing that motor task. There will be some transfer from certain exercises because you are doing a couple things. One, you're teaching the body to produce more force. And two, you're basically the, the, that motor unit statement, you're getting a better synchronization of motor units to be able to produce force faster. Okay, so it, it, in sport, it's not, and, and in these events of track and whatever, it's not just about the force production capability, right? So if we look at its core, you know, if we look at the best power lifter in the world, and we say, okay, that guy can produce, a, or that lady can produce a lot of force, right? Well, can they apply that specifically to the task at hand in baseball? So just because this person can produce a lot of force does not mean that they can produce it at a high speed in the right motor task. So you have to understand with specificity that, that from our end on strength training, we give an athlete the tools to potentially do better with the tasks that they're trying to form because we increase their ability to produce force and we increase the ability to produce force at a higher speed, right? So if we look at the sprinting and running, right? Sprinting and running is something that will pretty much that could potentially help almost any team sport athlete, okay? Because that task, that motor task of sprinting and running is something that you see all throughout like sport, okay? Now the, the thing is, is like we're giving them the raw capability to sprint and jump, sprint faster and jump higher. How they choose to use that is up to them on the field or in the field of play or whatever. Right? So you have to understand that when it comes to the said principle, the most specific thing that you can do is play the sport. The most specific thing that you can do is like practice the motor task at hand. Strength training is general. There's nothing in the weight room that will replicate what you can do on a court, on a field, etc., unless you are talking about a weightlifting sport or a powerlifting sport, and you could have an argument for throwing sports in there as well. Throwing sports are very similar to lifting weights, and essentially you're just lifting a weight at a very fast speed that's a lighter weight in a throwing event. But, I digress. There's the, the weight room's general, but those things that you do in the weight room might have a better transfer over to the uh, task that you see in a game. So, the biggest point of this whole thing is that, you, one, I need you to understand that this said principle is essentially specificity. Okay? Without specificity, you are not going to get the improvement that you need. Okay? And like I, you know, if we, this is very more about athletes, right? This is pretty much talking about athletes. So for anyone out there who's not interested in training athletes, let's say you're interested in cardiac rehab. Okay? When you're talking about the specificity principle, you need to look at that individual that you're working with and say, what is the specific thing that we need to focus on with you? And when you're looking at a cardiac patient who comes right out of heart surgery, the first thing is ambulating and cardiac health, right? So if you look at that person and say, oh, well, in the strength training class, I need specific things. And, you know, we're going to look at, you know, try to get like a, you know, three by 10 at 60% uh, machine workout for this person, like right off the bat. Well, then you've ignored the specificity principle, even though you're doing something that might produce overload. Right? Because at the end of the day, you have to see what's specific at that time and where they're going. At some point, the general weight room training and muscular, uh, muscular building of strength training, that might help that person, but you need to see if it's specific or not. The specificity principle is really important when you're talking about athletes. Okay? It's, it's almost like that's 90% of your battle. Okay? Because if you're not doing the things that are specific for what that athlete needs, then you're already missing the boat and you're essentially just getting athletes tired. So pretty much any argument of any program you write will really come down to, are you producing overload and is the things that you're doing specific to what you need? And you have to be able to get an argument for that, okay? Like you have to have the argument to say, this is why we're doing this, because it's specific for this task or et cetera. Also understand that as a strength coach or performance coach, you have to be able to blend, like you have to look at things holistically and you have to be able to blend what you're doing. Strength training is not the only answer unless you're talking, 
for the most part, unless you're talking about strength sports, right? Strength training is going to be very important in powerlifting and weightlifting because that is the sport. It is truly the specificity of the sport. But when you're looking at like football even, right? Football is a big sport where lifting and Olympic lifting and stuff is very like equated. Like it's almost like they have to go together. Well, you have to understand that sometimes just because somebody can lift very, very well is not the reason that they are good at sports. They are good at sports because they're a better athlete and they can perceive things really well in the field. They're great decision makers. They're smarter than their opponents, right? Those are things that you have to consider, okay? So just understand that with the specificity principle and the said principle, uh, one, know the acronym, so know what the said principle is, but two, like understand that the decisions that you make is you're giving, you need to give the right amount and the right types of stress to people at the right times. That is your entire job, okay? And if you can do that in the right way for the person in the situation and environment you're in, then you're gonna be pretty well off as a strength coach or a performance coach. Okay, so now that we have like this specificity principle, we kinda hopefully have a better understanding of what specificity is, there's another principle that we need to go into and it's more about like manipulating the types of stress that you give to somebody. Okay, so when we're talking about like, all right, we have, we need this specific stress. Well, how do we manipulate that to maybe make it more specific or maybe produce some overload, et cetera? And that comes from the FIT principle, okay? So FIT principle stands for frequency, intensity, type, and time. Now those things are how you basically get into the nitty gritty of program, okay? So the questions, the, I look at these as questions, okay? So I see frequency, it's like, all right, how often Am I doing X? How often or how or how not often am I going to apply this stimulus? The intensity. How intense or how much effort or et cetera is this task going to require? Okay? The type. Now the type is pretty much similar to what we just talked about. So what am I even doing? What is that X? What is that thing that we're talking about? And time. How do I manipulate the time I'm under tension or the time that I'm dedicating to this overall, okay? Those things are how you manipulate a program. So for example, if we're looking at full body versus split body, right? That is an example of talking about the difference between a frequency problem and also an intensity, but it's mostly frequency, right? Because we're saying, all right, does this person need to address these body parts multiple, more than a couple times a week? Like if we're gonna do a full body split four times a week, well, then I'm saying that the whole body is getting addressed more frequently, right? So if we're going to have something addressed more frequently, inherently what that does to intensity is it brings it down. Because the more intense something is, the harder it is to recover from, and you need that time for recovery, which means you sacrifice the frequency. So depending on the adaptation that you're going for, that really dictates whether the frequency is high or low and whether the intensity is high and low. Right? Another way that you can kind of manipulate the periodization model is time, right? And you can do that on a macro or a micro scale. So on a macro scale, it looks like, all right, like how much time am I gonna to dedicate to hypertrophy? How much time am I gonna to dedicate to power? Right? You could also look at that on a micro level. How much time am I going to spend for this set? How much time am I gonna spend on mobility? How much time in this practice are we gonna spend working on X skill? Okay, so the frequency, intensity, type, and time, that is how you actually program, right? So you know that we need to have something specific and we know we need to overload it over time. Once you have those two things, then you need to say, okay, well, like, how, how often am I gonna be doing it? How intense is it gonna be? And how much time can I dedicate to that? Now, you answering those questions is going to be very much predicated on the environment that you're in, and I encourage you to listen to this like really listen to this and understand what I'm about to say. Most of the decisions that coaches and um, you know trainers, et cetera, that people make on their programming, they come down to one, understanding what the needs are, and two, understanding their environment, okay? There's a big difference in working in a college setting with athletes and a private sector, right? So, and that comes down to the type of environment you're in. So if I look at a college sector, their college sector training for a football team, for example. There is a certain amount of time that you're even allowed to interact with the athletes, and I'm pretty sure that it's eight hours per week in the off season, right? So I only have eight hours a week to even work with these, these athletes, right? And I'm pretty sure some of that is actually reserved for like actual coaches. 
So you need to look at a team full of 80 plus people in whatever weight room situation training facility you have and say, what, how often can I work with these people within this time frame that I'm allotted, right? I only have eight hours, right? And that includes time with coaches, time in meetings, et cetera. So I actually only have five hours in this week. That's one hour a day. So my frequency is actually going to be more determined on not what I want, but maybe like what's optimal. You know what I mean? Hey, you know what? We're going to have four high stress days a week. One day is going to be an off day. Two of these days will be an hour or, or an hour and a half. And the rest will be however that math divvies up. Because on that hour and a half day, we want to make sure we're working on sprinting and team agility work. And on the other days, we're going to be doing our lift. It's going to be 45 minutes in and out with a 15 minute warm up. So I've just determined my frequency based upon the environment that I'm in. Now, if we look at a private sector, it might be, hey, listen, you know what? Dude, I have two hour slots every single day that are open, right? And you could come in for those two hour slots any day. So that's a full 10 hours that I could ideally do what I want and work with somebody that I want, right? When it comes to training, right? But that was predicated on my environment. It had nothing to do, like that decision really didn't have anything to do with my specificity yet. That was just on my environment. Now, if we go into the specificity a little bit, let's say that, you know what, hey, we need to increase the force production capability in our athletes, and the route that we're gonna go is, we wanna do, you know, box squat. We wanna squat to a box, stand up, and we're trying to move the weight as fast as we can, or, or sorry, how about we change it? Let's go trap bar jumps. So we have a trap bar, and we need to do jumps with the trap bar to increase our power output, right? In the college setting, if we go to a lower division uh, school and you're there and you say, you know what, I wanna work on power, I don't really know how to do Olympic lifts, I'm gonna do trap bar jumping. And you go in there and there's two trap bars and there's six racks and there's 50 guys in there at a time. That decision of stress that you wanna apply, you need to find another way to apply that stress because your environment won't let you, right? If I go to the private sector, well, I don't have a problem. I have three trap bars and I only have you know, six people in there at a time. So I can even add in equipment for that. I could say, you know what, we're gonna have bands on there and I'm even gonna measure the velocity. So having an understanding that your environment is gonna dictate your frequency, intensity, and time, and even your type a little bit, right? Because I just said right there, I wanted to do trap bar jumps, for power development, but I don't have enough. So you have to understand that once you decide what things you need to get, and you're more looking at the adaptations, right? And the specific skills that you want to get better at. Once you figure that out, the other things around you, the environment, the time, the amount of coaches you have, the amount of help you have, that will determine what you're able to do. And that goes even for the clinical stuff, for the PT stuff. You know, in a PT setting, you might really be in a one-on-one -on -one with all the equipment that you need. So you might not have as many limitations, which will allow you to really impose the specific demand that you want. If you're in a clinical setting, you're probably not going to have that problem either. So you just have to understand that your environment and other people's environment might dictate the decisions that they make. And you have to always take that into account before you look at something and say, oh, that's stupid. Like, why are they doing that? Well, they might be doing that because of the environment that they're in. Now, don't get me wrong. You can look out there and there is stupid. There is a lot of stupid out there. And it's hard to sift through what's stupid and what is okay because somebody's in a rough environment. You have to be able to understand that, okay? So when you're moving on to like writing programs and stuff, these are the things you manipulate and you manipulate that based upon the environment that you are presented, okay? So this lecture is very important, right? We have like this specificity principle and this is the most important, one of, probably the most important principle uh, other than consistency when it comes to training any type of training, because if you're not doing the thing that is specific to the adaptation that you want, your body won't adapt to it. Your body is one of the most amazing things on this planet because no, what you specifically do to it is what it will adapt to. Your body, there's no lying to your body. There's no tricking your body and confusing your body. It's just gonna adapt to what you do to it. So one of the best examples is, is especially now in quarantine, we have a bunch of athletes who are having their coach tell them, hey, you gotta get in shape, so I need you to run, go run long distance. So I have a football player who needs to be very explosive, they need to produce a lot of force, they need to be powerful in very short bouts with long, moderate rest periods, and you're telling them that the demand that they need to impose on their body is long distance running. Well, that's not specific to the sport at all. At the end of the day, you're not even giving them a chance to go out on the field and improve. You're just telling them that they need to run long distance to get in shape. What shape 
are you really talking about? That is a violation of the specificity principle in itself, and it's one of the most known ones. Okay, so have an understanding of what this principle means. Um, you need to know the acronyms for both of these. Okay, so you need to know if, if a question comes up where it's like, what's the said principle? You should be able to write it out. Same thing with the fit principle. Okay, so this is the only lecture for this week. Next week, we're going to get into plyometrics um, and 1RM testing. So those ones will be a little bit more in depth um, as far as the information on the lecture. But other than that, move on to the next thing.